Welcome to our interview with Diego Clavian from Northwestern University. So, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks for asking. Excellent. How about you? So, how did you start your work in AI and finance? And what came first, AI or finance? Well, so AI, AI came first. So if I'm, I've been working with AI-related technologies for more than 10 years. And then uh, finance sort of came about three, four years ago. Um, and basically, sort of, I, it was more by coincidence. So I met with a faculty member from a different faculty member from a different university in Chicago. And so he's an expert in finance. And he said that he has keen interest in sort of applying machine learning to finance. So that's how so we hooked together and then started working together. So the, my very first work from three, four years ago was done in collaboration with him. And uh, sort of that's how I got started and now sort of I have quite a few students sort of working in finance and, and AI. Sure. So tell us about your career path and how you ended up as a professor at Northwestern University. Yeah, my career path is not that exciting in a sense because I spent my entire career in academia. Uh, so I graduated and after graduation sort of I started immediately as a faculty member at the University of Illinois Branch Champaign and then moved to uh, Chicago at Northwestern University 17 years ago roughly. Um, but even though I spent my entire career in academia, sort of, I actually have quite a, uh, I've done quite a lot of work with businesses and uh, so I know how it works, how, how it feels sort of working with businesses and, and I have uh, quite a strong business acumen. Uh, so I do a lot of projects with companies, sort of it's kind of like consulting engagement, even though it's true in Northwestern, right? So it's not really consulting engagement, but it kind of feels like that. Uh, and I do also clearly do sort of site consulting as well. Uh, and I also started my own firm about four years ago and now grew uh, pretty big. So I have, in other words, sort of, despite spending my entire career in academia, sort of, uh, I'm very well connected and, and I feel sort of that I understand how businesses work even though I never work in a business sure. environment. Really. True business environment. <laughs> <laughs> so you're also founding director, master of science and analytics and the deep learning lab. Right. Um, what is the goal of this lab? So the lab, so it's been in making for more than a year uh, and we officially uh, started it uh, well, about three months ago roughly. Uh, so it's growing in, in terms of membership, right? So companies are members of, uh, of the center. Uh, and the main goal is, is essentially to democratize uh, deep learning, right? So a lot of companies currently that do POC uh, projects uh, related to deep learning but then they don't quite have the expertise and also sort of the IT solutions to actually bring those deep learning POCs to production so one of our goal one of the goals of the center is sort of we uh, is to actually facilitate that move and we are currently have a big project that is essentially developing software for taking a deep learning model from POC or in other words from kind of training to the actual uh, production. Right? So that's our that's our main goal. And then so this clearly clear this project sort of is going to serve so it's it's an open source project. It's going to benefit a lot of the companies and a lot of the members of the center. Uh, but the various companies that are members of the center so they can also uh, benefit by uh, executing individual projects, tailored kind of projects uh, with the center. So uh, so in other words, sort of, as I said, so democratization of deep learning is number one goal. And then kind of a secondary goal, but kind of equally important from the company's perspective, is to open uh, a hiring pipeline for them. Right? So, a lot of the, so a lot of companies want to partner with academia because uh, they see that as an opportunity for hiring. Right? So that's also a secondary goal. So we're, we're going to have a few career fairs, fairs in a sense, just just the PhD students working on deep learning and machine learning so that uh, they'll be able to interact with companies for, uh, for hiring. So those are the two main goals, big goals. Excellent. So between your role here and at the university, what does a typ typical day look like for you? Um, all right, so that's kind of a, <laughs> let's say, loaded question. Right? <laughs> there, there's actually a very short answer to it. Right? I pretty much, if you look at my calendar, I have meetings from eight to five. <laughs> and then at five, sort of, I catch up with emails and, and yeah. uh, IM messages, etc. 
Uh, but look, I mean, on the other hand, it, 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 I told you the truth, actually. Right? <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, you know, my schedule is exactly what I want it to be, right? Yeah. So I have uh, a lot of sort of meetings with students, meetings with, uh, with companies sort of on projects, right, or research projects. And then I travel quite a lot as well, and I do a lot of remote calls uh, when I travel sure. as well. Uh, and then clearly there's a, there's a typical academic uh, uh, typical academic duties, right? So teaching, we have to for, do that, and then uh, being the director of the two uh, initiatives, so that also takes uh, quite some time. Yeah. Uh, but in other words, it's literally just meeting after meeting after another one. <laughs> Excellent. You spoke at the summit about pushing the limits of recurrent neural networks. What makes recurrent neural networks useful in finance? Sure. So recurrent neural networks, so they they have an inter uh, an, an inherent um, let's call it uh, demand for uh, for time, right? So demand, uh, it's not the right, the, uh, they're not good, good terms, okay? So essentially, they are very good at dealing with data that has a temporal dimension, right? And in finance, at least sort of, I'm, my, my, uh, most of my interest is actually on the market side, right? On the trading, sorry, actually, on the trading side, not so much on financial services side, like banks, etc. right? So in other words, uh, know, chatbots, etc. That's not really uh, my main interest and focus, right? So when you think about market data, sort of every, like, let's say, book order update uh, has a timestamp, right? So everything has a has a temporal dimension. So and if you have that kind of data, then recurrent neural networks are uh, are kind of the most obvious choice, or or not just the most obvious. They're kind of pretty much the only choice when it comes to deep learning, right? So they're traditional uh, models like Arima, etc. But in, when it comes to deep learning based uh, modern models, we are talking about recurrent neural networks, right? So that's why sort of recurrent neural networks are kind of the best, uh, the best model for, for financial or for trading uh, data. Now, when it comes to recurrent neural networks, sort of you can uh, open a textbook sort of and you see what is uh, a recurrent neural network and you can potentially even implement it, right? Uh, but, uh, Textbook models, so they leave quite a lot, and this is what, I, what I've been working with students and, and what I showed in my work is, they leave quite a lot on the table if you just take textbook models, right? So you can, you can push them, you can enhance them, uh, you can add new features to the models that are going to, so from the machine learning perspective, they're going to give only a marginal improvement, but that marginal improvement, sort of when it comes to the actual trading profit, they can actually translate to uh, to big money, right? So, uh, and as I said, so they, all, all of these enhancements that I built in the last few years, they're all based on recurrent networks because it's sort of the most natural uh, type of a model for temporal data. Okay. So, what challenges are you currently facing, and how are you using artificial intelligence to overcome them? Uh, so challenges. So. Uh, one of the challenge, one of the pretty big challenges, sort of uh, data access. Uh, even though that one, sort of, it's I wouldn't call it a big one, but it is a challenge, right? So big. I mean, so if you're just somebody, kind of, if you're just an outsider and you're trying to get public data, uh, you're not going to get a lot of it, right? So, but if you build the right connections, etc., companies will share the data uh, with you. Right, so that, that's one challenge. But actually, the biggest challenge I find in this finance-related work is the fact that uh, it would be great to actually evaluate uh, the output of the models or predictions, say, based on a very realistic uh, trading environment and platform. Right, and that's where at least academia sort of we don't have access to that. Right, so in hedge funds and investment firms. They spend decades, literally decades, sort of building these ev uh, evaluation software packages and, and uh, architecture, etc. And clearly, they're not going to share it just like that. Right? Mm. Uh, so, evaluating our benefits on kind of very simple environment on simulations, right? On very simple simulations, sort of clearly is not quite reliable, right? So one of so so in summary. The biggest challenge for me is actually is actually how to evaluate my solutions in a realistic environment, right? And it goes back to my previous remark, which is essentially I have to 
build the right bridges and right connections to companies that are willing to share their or to actually to evaluate my stuff uh, with their uh, evaluators, right? Because they're not they're not going to just give me quote their uh, evaluation uh, software, right? So they will just essentially uh, take my solutions and then run them on their uh, environment. And I'm making uh, I was able to make a pretty good inroad sort of in that direction. So I have now a very good connection uh, with a downtown firm, uh, downtown Chicago firm. Yeah. That's going to allow me to do that. Okay. So you also work within insurance and healthcare. How is the work that you're doing in finance transferable to these other industries? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I do actually quite a lot of work with uh, insurance companies uh, and healthcare as well. Um, so one, one big difference between the two is that data in finance, it's uh, it's quote nicer. It's yeah. what I would call kind of structured data. Okay. Right. So there's not sort of a jungle in insurance and and uh, healthcare. It's literal. It's literally a jungle, right? So uh, it takes us three to six months to get sort of just a, a sample of the data yeah. from insurance uh, on on or, or healthcare, right? And it's not that. It's not that we don't have internal IT knowledge, right? So because we are not quote, poking around their systems, right? So it's the it's the collaborator, so the insurance company, uh, uh, our point of context there. They have to make tons of calls, tons of emails to yeah. put together the data and and link together the data, etc. Right? In finance, sort of, it's uh, that aspect is is easier. Uh, in a sense, because usually, for example, market data is just sort of in one and only one uh, database, and you are accessing mm -hmm. only that one, right? So, but insurance, sort of, we talk about f uh, 10, 20 databases. And healthcare is even a bigger mess. I mean, healthcare literally, sort of, we're not talking about six months now, we're talking about a year to pull the data from, uh, from a system and then link it together, trying to understand the data, have to talk to a bunch of physicians. So, healthcare, it's, it's really. Uh, it's a it's a big mess. Sure. Um, the other sort of challenge or difference between the two is sort of in finance and again sort of I'm focusing on trading. I'm mostly talking about trading, right? Uh, explainability it's not really a big deal, right? So because the kind of the the culture is not the culture. The thinking is well, if I can profit, right? Uh, I don't care how the algorithm works. Right? Yeah. But in insurance and healthcare, they want to. Uh, the decision makers, right, or line of business users, they want to understand how the decisions are being made, right? So you have to be able to explain the models, and deep learning models are notoriously hard to explain, right? Sure. So that, that's, that's a big difference between the two. Okay. So there's a huge amount of data available in finance, as we've mentioned. What measures are in place, and what needs to be improved to ensure data is kept safe and secure in that field? Right, so I, I actually think that in so when it comes to trading side, uh, the data is there are not that many bridges or this sort of I would have to think really hard sort of to come up with a bridge that happened on a with trading data, right? Uh, so finance institutions are because so trading data it's really more or exclusively uh, used internally, right? So it's not data that's exposed to uh, to either other businesses or other customers, right? So so hedge funds, etc. They're mostly, uh, or you. I mean, you can. So all right. So it is a little bit delicate. All right. So, but uh, you can't quite say that they're B two C, a B two C company, right? So even though they do have clients, right? So, but it's a much smaller number of clients. So they don't have to expose the data to their own clients. So that's why the chance of getting a bridge, sort of uh, a bridge, it's it's much smaller, right? Uh, but in terms of sort of in terms of how to. Uh, how to deal with cybersecurity. Uh, so uh, they have to have processes in place like every other company. Uh, one, one challenge I see sort of in general with companies is uh, that they invest uh, in a certain software and then so that software becomes entrenched in the company and replacing that software or upgrading it uh, it's a big capital expenditure, and they're reluctant to do that, right? So that essentially means that they are uh, they're getting tied to 
software that becomes obsolete sort of relatively quickly, uh, and upgrading it, it would be very expensive, right? Okay. So I have quite a few experiences with companies, for example, that purchase software, actually even build internal software, say four or five years ago, which is not that long ago, right? So, but when they build it four or five years ago, it was based on technology from, uh, from that time, right? Today's technology, for example, is much more advanced, right? So, and it's just too big of an investment for them to switch from four or five year old technology to the current technology, right? So, in the same way it comes to, so I'm bringing this generic case, right? So when, when it comes to cybersecurity, tools and process, et cetera, it's the same, right? So uh, things become obsolete very quickly and you have to upgrade and you have to put capital on the table and that's where it, it becomes very tricky. Right? Sure. So so definitely definitely finding a way and I don't have sort of, I don't have a solution. So but for companies finding a way to, to be using up-to-date software, uh, so Whichever company finds a way to use up-to-date software and comes to cybersecurity, I think that company so will uh, stay ahead of the game. Great. Okay. So, what have you enjoyed most about the summit so far today? Oh, well, I, I like it. So, I like to attend every single one of them. Uh, so, the aspect that I like a lot is that uh, it's a nice blend of business and let's call it technical aspects, right? Because you have you have venues that are completely business related and then you have venues that are completely scholarly venues, right? So what I like about this kind of events is that they blend nicely the two of them uh, and sort of you sort of learn business aspects but you also hear about technical uh, technical aspects. So that's, that's what I like a lot. And uh, the other stuff is sort of meeting new people, right? So establishing new connections because uh, they're always beneficial. Uh, so that's also sort of what I like a lot. And the quality talk of talks, sort of, as I said, is, is just extremely high, and that's what I like about the Excellent. summit. Cheers, Diego. Thanks very much. All right. Cheers. Thank you very much.